Okay, and so I call folks to consistency, right? I think it was R.C. Sproul who said that we we must not be people who have mere profession of faith, but we must be people who are in possession of a genuine faith. And what is the genuine faith that the scriptures uh, speak about? A genuine faith is a faith that is evidenced through good works. We are not saved by good works, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, right? We're not saved by our works, but our works evidence the genuineness of our faith. And so if you are committed to Christ, pardon me, adjust my, I think I was shrinking there for a second. My seat was going down. He's a gone. Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. I hope all is well with you and everything's going great. I was going to go over this video that was posted here on New Year's Day, and it will be a negation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll play a couple of clips of it, and I'll show you how he has faulty interpretation of certain verses where he backloads works. But mainly this will be a demonstration of how people will negate the gospel itself and make it about works. That the only reason you can ultimately know that you're saved is about your works. And I'll go ahead and I'll play some clips from him that will demonstrate that's what he's teaching here. And again, I don't have any personal issues with this person. I have listened to their content time and time again because they have taught on presuppositional apologetics through the years. But I noticed that they were never clarifying or talking about the gospel all this time, but they've been learning and learning and learning more and more about presuppositional apologetics and different things concerning the faith as far as apologetic defenses for the Christian faith. But when we actually get into his definition, how he's understanding faith in accordance to the gospel, it seems that he's learning, 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 but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So I'm going to go ahead and get into this clip. We'll play it, and we'll see what's wrong with it. Think about a genuine faith is a faith that is evidenced through good works. We are not saved by good works, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, right? We're not saved by our works, but our works evidence the genuineness of our faith and so if you are committed to christ pardon me adjust my i think i was shrinking there for a second my seat was going down so you see here he gives the gospel in part to the one who doesn't work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly his faith is accredited to righteousness that is in part the gospel so a person who believes and believes in the promises of God can know that they're justified and righteous independent from works. But then he goes on to say that what proves that you're saved, the legitimacy of your faith is your works. So if your works prove the legitimacy of your faith, then you cannot know you're saved by your faith in Jesus Christ. You have to look to your works because he's saying your works is evidence and proof of your faith. So you can't know if you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll have to look to your works to see if you actually have true faith. So it completely negates the point to the one who doesn't work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accredited to righteousness because according to him, you have to look back to your works to know if you're really justified and really made righteous to see if you have real true faith. You have to look to your works. So it makes to the one who doesn't work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly a complete and total mute point. Because in one hand, you're double talking when you tell a person that works don't save a person, but works demonstrate and prove that a person say that that is, they can't just take confidence in their faith in Jesus Christ. They have to look to some kind of future works and performance to really know that their faith is legitimate and that they are really saved. In 1 John, when it says these things are right to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, it does not say these things are right to you who have works on the backside of faith that you can know that you have eternal life based on your works. The condition to know that you have eternal life is on the basis of faith. These things are right to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, not thank or hope or wish it's a possibility, 
but by your faith you can know that you have eternal life. But in the system that he is setting up, you can't know that you have eternal life based on your faith in Jesus Christ. The true evidence is what you see in terms of your works. So he's trying to look for evidence of things seen to legitimize his faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of the things not seen. He's trying to look for things seen in terms of his own personal obedience to make a self-judgment, a self-justification of himself that on the basis of his works, he has true faith. Now, this is all built off a faulty interpretation of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where he goes on to say, Yes, by grace we have been saved through faith, not of ourselves, but as a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. But then he goes on to point out that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it talks about the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And if a person doesn't properly understand what the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them as defined in Ephesians, then you will have a faulty interpretation. You'll import your own understanding. You'll think it has to do with works of the law. Scripture says we have died to the law. The law has come to its end. We've been freed from the law and we're not under the law. Paul said, through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. So to live for God, we actually died to the law and the works of the law. We're not looking to the works of the law. That's not the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them as the works of the law. But the works that we are to walk in is the edification of the saints, the building up of the body of Christ, till we all reach to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, as mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, where it tells us that some he's made to be prophets, some apostles, some evangelists, some preachers, some teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the saints, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all reach to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So the work of the ministry, the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them is the edification of the saints, the building up of the body of Christ till we reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. The works of the ministry that don't have to do with the works of the law. It has to do with building each other up in the faith. And part of that work of the ministry would be telling people how we've died to the law, how the law has come to its end, how we've been freed from the law and we're not under the law. That part of the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them is the work of the ministry and telling people how we have no living relationship to the law. You have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be joined to another that as him has been raised from the dead. So the good works that God prepared beforehand are not the law. If anything, it's telling people that are in Christ that they have died to the law. They're not under law. They've been freed from the law and the law has come to its end. So they come out of a spirit of condemnation, bondage, and fear and walk in the justification reality that they have by faith. We maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, that we have a justified, not guilty verdict by our faith, independent from law performance. And that's how we live on a daily basis, that the just shall live by faith. Not that the just shall live by works, but that the just shall live by faith. And that through the law, I die to the law that I might live for God. In other words, I died to the works of the law that I might live for God. So I'm going to play his statement back so you can see that that is the implications he's giving, that you can't know that you're saved by faith alone in Christ, but you have to look to your works to know if your faith is legitimate, if you're really saved. A genuine faith is a faith that is evidenced through good works. We're not saved by good works, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, right? We're not saved by our works, but our works evidence the genuineness of our faith. And so if you are committed to Christ, pardon me, adjust my... So the behind the scenes boast here is that he's committed to Christ because of his works and that his works demonstrate that he's committed to Christ but if Christ was really to judge our works, he would judge them as filthy rags. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. So that's why the Bible says not because of works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy, he saved us. And he makes it sound like works is what demonstrates that you're committed to God. First off, Jesus is committed to us. If it was left to us, we would leave and forsake him every single time. If it was up to us, but Jesus keeps us, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he keeps us. 
The only reason we're not forsaking him is it's because it's God who wills and works in you according to his good pleasure and he keeps us in his hands. And in his grace and in his faithfulness, he's committed to us and it's not on the basis of our works. He will never leave or forsake us. And here again, you see him say that what proves his faith to be legitimate is his works and that's what really demonstrates a person's faith. And if they're really saved, that would be the ultimate implication as if works demonstrate and legitimize your faith, then the only way you can know you're saved is by your works, not by Christ and what he's done. You've got to look to your works ultimately to know if you're saved, because if you don't have the works, you don't have legitimate faith. That's what this leads to ultimately. Notice how he tried to give part the gospel that to the one who doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness, which is the gospel. The ungodly person is justified, got a non-guilty verdict. They are the righteousness of God by their faith, independent from works. But he's ultimately negating the gospel when he says you really can't know if you're justified or righteous unless you have the works. That's how you know you have legitimate faith, as if you have the works, and then you can really know if you're justified and righteous. You're just looking to your works to justify yourself and to make yourself righteous. That's all it would lead to by implication. Now, what these people will ultimately do a lot of times is say, no, we just believe in this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, and he's helping us to keep the law better. And what it ends up with is a theology like the man in the front of the temple who says, I thank you, God. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a swindler. I fast twice a week. I give one tenth of my earning. You become like the man in the front of the temple who thanks God and believes, well, God gave me this changed life. I thank God. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a swindler. They believe that God's helping them not to be these things. But it's ultimately just the self-justification under the law. And we see that in the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. So these people obviously believed in God. They're up at the temple praying. Jesus said he told this parable to those who trusted in their own righteousness and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one being a tax collector, the other a Pharisee. The Pharisee stood apart from himself and said, I thank you, God, I'm not a adulterer, I'm not a swindler. I fast twice a week and I give one-tenth of my earning. The man in the back of the temple could not even raise his eyes towards heaven, but smote upon his chest and said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went home justified rather than the other. For he who humbles himself will be exalted, and he who exalts himself will be humbled. So we see that Jesus said the man in the back of the temple went home justified rather than the other. To the one who doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. We maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. See, this man in the front of the temple would have said, look, my works under the law demonstrate and legitimize my faith. I'm not a adulterer. I'm not a swindler. I fast twice a week. I give one tenth of my earning. Look how legitimate my faith is. Jesus said that man was not justified, that he did not go home justified. He's under the illusion he's a believer in God, but he's appealing to his works and performance. He's looking down at the man in the back of the temple and saying, I thank you, God, I'm not like other men. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a swindler. I fast twice a week. I give one tenth of my earning. So if works prove the legitimacy of your faith, then why isn't Jesus saying, look, this man, he's not an adulterer, he's not a swindler, he's fasting twice a week, he's giving one-tenth of his earning. If works are a litmus test that a person is really justified and saved, then this should be a parable demonstrating that. It demonstrates the very opposite. Now, if what this fellow was saying in the video is right, then you could simply come up to that man in the front of the temple and said, look, he's not a adulterer, he's not a swindler, he's fasting twice a week, he gives one-tenth of her earning, his earning. This demonstrates and legitimizes his faith. We know he's saved. We know he's really saved. Look at his works. Look at his obedience. Imagine giving the gospel to someone for the first time and that sinner asking you, am I saved? Am I, am I really saved by Jesus? And the person says, well, you are if you start to show works. If you end up having the works that are really demonstrate that you're a person that is saved and you can make that self-determination for yourself, that self-justification by your works that you're saved, then you're saved. Then you can know that you're really saved. But right now, you're just believing. Right now, we haven't seen any works. So we can't know if you're saved. That's what this would lead to.
when the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that is the only litmus test to know if you're saved. These things are right to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So to know that you have eternal life, you just have to be a believer in Jesus Christ and his accomplishments on the cross on your behalf that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we don't get that righteousness through the law. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. And indirectly, that's what he's making people think. If you have to look to your works to find out if you have a true legitimate faith, then you're looking to your works to see if you really have a right standing with God. And that is nullifying the grace of God. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness or a right standing with God came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. See, if works legitimize your faith and prove your faith, then you're looking to your works to see if you really have a right standing with God. This is going to nullify the grace of God. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if right standing or righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. By telling a person you can't know if your faith is legitimate until you look to your works is saying until you see your works, you can't know if you have a right standing or a righteousness with God ultimately by implication. So I'm going to go to another part in this video where he has a passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. But again, he interprets it like every Calvinist does and also any other false gospel teacher where they teach that these people are actually keeping the law. That's not what this passage is teaching. Let me go to it. Darkness has he saved us from, okay? The scripture speaks of a general darkness, the ways of darkness or walking in darkness, but there is some specificity included in there, right? In 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, we get some of the, the, the specifics as to the sorts of darkness that God has saved us from. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And look, check this out. This is beautiful. He says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Notice that Paul says such were some of you, right? Indicating past tense, right? This is what some of them were. This is what some of you were, but not anymore, right? They were called. See, when it says, such were some of you, it's talking about positionally under the law. You were found some measure of guilt. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. So this is what it means when it says, such were some of you. See, you were under the law and you were found a measure of guilt. But notice it goes on to say, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified in the name of the Lord and in the spirit of our God that they were justified. Well, they were justified by faith apart from the works of the law. We maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So Paul is not saying, look, you people are keeping the law and that's why you're justified because you don't do these naughty things anymore. He's saying they're justified because they're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And once they're justified, they're no longer under the law. The law is a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ. Once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Once you have a justified not guilty verdict by your faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster, which is a reference to the law, which would reference your guilt. So that's why he can say such were some of you, because you're no longer under the law. And if you're no longer under the law, you're no longer under its guilty ruling and verdict. But what this fellow means by this and Paul Washer and John MacArthur is that, look, you guys are justified because you no longer do these things. You no longer behave in this way anymore as though they have some kind of righteousness or justification of their own through the law now. We see the scriptures say, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So we know these people were not justified in the sight of God because they were keeping the law. They were justified by faith. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified 
in the name of the Lord and in the Spirit of our God. See, when you're justified by faith, you're no longer under the law, which means you will not be found a worker of iniquity, you will not be found guilty or have a guilty ruling or verdict against you. And this is why he's saying such were some of you. He's not saying such were some of you because now you've been justified because you're doing the works of the law. The gospel as we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. To the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. We can see that this is a list of ungodly people, adulterers, swindlers, fornicators, people that covet. Jesus justifies these people. He gives them a non-guilty verdict independent from them working to the one who doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, that is Jesus. They receive a not guilty verdict. His faith is accredited to righteousness. And from that point, we go on to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us, living in the justified, not guilty verdict reality where we're the righteousness of God independent from our works and the law. So you are washed, you are justified, you are sanctified in the name of the Lord and in the Spirit of our God. Notice that we didn't justify ourselves in the flesh by the works of the law. We were justified in the Spirit of God. You were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified. Sanctified is something that Jesus did for us on the cross. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified, past tense. By one single offering, he has perfected us forever, those who are sanctified in the past tense. We see in Hebrews 10.10, 10, it says, By his will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So don't let anyone come along and tell you that you haven't been sanctified by Jesus and his cross once and for all. Now, people with religious works mindset will tell you that you have to get on the road of progressive sanctification. They won't tell you that it's in Christ. They'll tell you that it's a progressive program, language that the Bible doesn't use. By his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom, so that just as it is written, let him boast, boast in the Lord. That if anyone would boast that they have redemption or righteousness or sanctification, they would boast in the Lord and not in themselves. That is, they would not boast in the flesh, but they would boast in the Lord. You are justified, you were sanctified in the name of the Lord and in the spirit of our God. So you can see he's having this faulty interpretation in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, which he's making it about people's works. And I'll play a little bit more of that so you can see that that's what he's saying. Sanctifying, justifying all the works of the Spirit of God upon the person that has been uh, taken from darkness and brought into uh, the light. And God has called us into the light until he calls us to live in the light, to walk in the light. When we are walking in the light, it is not... Now that's the other thing is he's defining walking in the light by not sinning when walking in the light is walking in the light and the truth of the gospel. Walking in the light is a reference to the enlightenment or truth of the gospel in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they cannot see the light or the enlightenment or the truth of the gospel in whose case the God of this world has blinded their minds from seeing it. So when John says, walk in the light as he is in the light, for our fellowship is with Christ, he's talking about walking in the truth, walking in the light of the gospel, that we are the righteousness of God in a pass from death to life, will not come into the judgment because of the sufficiency of the atonement of the blood of Christ. If you don't believe that you're justified independent from works of the law and that you're the righteousness of God by faith and that you've passed from death to life and will not come into the judgment, then you're not walking in the light. If you don't believe those essential things about the gospel, that we have a justified not guilty verdict by our faith independent from works, then you're not walking in the light. See, when the Apostle John is talking about not walking in the light, he's talking about Antichrist and people that have gone the way of Cain, that they're not walking in the light, they're not walking in the truth. That's the context. Light. When we are walking in the light, it is not simply kind of, you know, and I'm saved now and that's it. Walking has reference to a lifestyle. We are walking after a particular lifestyle. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, 
See, he's making the lifestyle about your works because he's saying it's a lifestyle. Then he goes on to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not understanding that that's not the works of the law, our personal obedience and performance. It's talking about the works of the ministry, as mentioned in Ephesians 4. The works of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. Over and over, there's admonishments that we are to live by faith, that the just shall live by faith, that we walk by faith, not by sight. That I have been crucified with Christ is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the way that we live on an ongoing basis is by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. Knowing that accomplished something, according to Colossians 1.22, he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So we live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself up for us, living in that reality that we are justified, holy, without blemish and free from accusation. Faith in Christ, true faith in Christ is not independent from the justified, not guilty verdict reality, independent from works and the law that we live on and in in a daily basis so they always want to teach that you start off by faith but then it's the rest of your life is all about your works when the bible teaches that we live by faith in the son of god who loved us and gave himself up for us that as you received him so walk in him rooted built up grounded in the faith abounding in thanksgiving so we received him by faith we walk in him by faith we see in the very book that he's teaching out of it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. That's an ongoing lifestyle of faith in Jesus Christ. So he's teaching that the lifestyle is about your works, not understanding the work of the ministry. He's negating the gospel. Imagine again a young believer coming and not having confidence that they're saved because they're trusting in Christ alone. They have to look to their work, some future works performance to legitimize and know if they're really saved and they have real true faith. God's handiwork. We are a product of God working on us through the power of his, of his spirit. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to what? To do good works, which God. Now remember, this is right on the heels of his interpretation of 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, that now he's bringing this into that interpretation that, see, the good works that God prepared beforehand. See, these people in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 were keeping the law. They were doing the good works that God prepared beforehand because he said such were some of you. They're not doing those things anymore. They're doing the works of the law. See, that's a faulty interpretation of that verse. And how many explanations I have done on this channel to show what that verse is saying and rightly divide it through the lens of the gospel. And yet you can see that on a mass perpetual scale that these people keep spreading this faulty interpretation that by implication ultimately leads to works justification, that people are looking to their works to justify themselves. So it's really amazing because this guy is an intelligent guy. He's always learning and learning and learning. But when it comes to the gospel, I'm finding more and more of what the scripture says to be true, that people are ever learning, but unable to come to the knowledge of the truth and what the clarification of the gospel actually is without caveating it with their own personal obedience. And in doing so, negating it for everybody else. So I'm going to probably keep this video short here, brothers and sisters. I went a little longer than I intended to. I at least try to keep my videos about 30 minutes. And I hope you're having a great day and a good new year. So God bless you. Peace to you. Take care. And I hope your night or day is going good. God bless. Gonna be here soon.